From the curse of natural resources to beyond American exceptionalism, it's our world as seen by Columbia University's Jeffrey Sachs. He is known as one of the world's leading experts on economic development and the fight against poverty. And for the past few years, Sachs has been a vocal anti-war advocate calling on the United States to end its endless wars. Now with the US President Donald Trump pulling US troops out of Syria and Turkey launching its offensive against the PKK YPG, Sachs says it's time for a just redistribution of global power. I sat down with Jeffrey Sachs in this exclusive one-on-one -on -one with TRT World. Professor Jeffrey Sachs, thank you so much for speaking to TRT World. The US is pulling out its troops from Syria. Turkey has launched um, an operation in northern Syria to create a safe zone. What is your assessment of the situation? My assessment is that what has happened could and should turn into a peace for all of Syria. Uh, we've now seen war go on for eight years. It's been devastating for the Syrian people, but it has been a hardship for everybody uh, because there's been violence, there has been millions and millions of people turned into refugees. Turkey bears a very heavy burden of the refugees. It's time for the fighting to end. And the uh, understanding of Turkey and Russia to make this zone safe, I think can be turned into a settlement for all of Syria uh, that would say this war is over. Uh, it should be over because what Syria needs is rebuilding. Uh, refugees should and want to go home to a safe environment. And I think that that's what the world must focus on right now. Take what is happening and make it peace. So there is some merit then in the Turkish argument to create that safe zone in northern Syria? Well, I think what Turkey said already five years ago, if you arm uh, the Kurds and you put them uh, into this region, this is not going to be stabilizing for this region. That was a warning already given many, many years ago by Turkey to President Obama. The United States uh, was uh, looking for uh, uh, troops to fight ISIS, uh, and uh, since the United States wasn't doing it itself, it armed others. But the root of the problem goes back even earlier than that, was there should never have been this war in Syria. It was just destabilizing for the region. It was unnecessary, and it has to end now. And you've, you've mentioned in your previous writings that the United States bears some responsibility for Syria's war. Can you expand on that? Well, I think the United States bears, sad to say, principal responsibility because in the middle of 2011, the president of the United States said that Assad, the ruler of Syria, has to go. In my opinion, it is not the job of the president of the United States to say who rules other countries. And when such a statement is made, that is the basis actually, and it was literally the basis for the US supporting mercenary armies for the U.S. Uh, and Saudi Arabia uh, teaming together to try to overthrow uh, Assad. I felt from the beginning that this was not only immoral against the U.N. Charter, but also doomed to fail because uh, Assad has allies, uh, Russia, uh, Iran. And so if you start that kind of idea that the United States is going to overthrow another country's uh, regime, it's not going to end well, and it did not end well, and it hasn't ended till today, but everybody has lost. There are no winners in this, and that's why this war absolutely should end. The country, in my opinion, should be politically unified again. Uh, the whole country should become a safe zone uh, because it should be safe to live in. That the UN Security Council could help to guarantee. President Putin, I think, is playing a constructive role right now but he can say also to Assad and to uh, the Syrian government, you are responsible, responsible for no retribution, no more violence. The violence has to end on all sides so that rebuilding can start. 
Yet there has been a backlash of sorts in the United States, both Republican and Democrat, to the U.S. decision to pull out troops from northern Syria, as well as the Turkish operation there. Why is there a backlash against a decision that you think is the correct one? Well, the mistake in Syria has also been bipartisan. Uh, after all, the U.S decision to try to overthrow the Syrian government was made by a democratic administration. It had Republican support. It's viewed uh, in geopolitical terms, by the way, no one in the U.S. cared about Assad or cared about Syria. It was viewed as an anti-Iranian operation. Okay, Assad is allied with Iran, therefore since Iran is the U.S. enemy, uh, Assad is the U.S. enemy. We have to overthrow Assad so that Iranian influence is weakened. What a way to think, by the way. It's just using countries as objects. Uh, and of course, it ends up devastatingly wrong. So when I see bipartisan opposition uh, to what's happening, I reflect on the fact that our foreign policy is broken in the United States by both parties. Uh, it's too militarized, it's arrogant, uh, it is intervening in places that the United States doesn't understand. When uh, Trump pulled out or said uh, that the U.S. would pull out, my feeling is that the problem was there was not at the time a framework for peaceful uh, settlement and uh, yet quickly uh, the uh, Turkish operation turned into an agreement with Russia for uh, ceasefire, for uh, policing uh, this situation, for allowing a peaceful disarmament uh, to take place. That's right. But I'd like to see, personally, a general political settlement that says Syria should become a unified country again. Uh, it should not have uh, all of these uh, mercenary armies paid for by the U.S. or by Saudi Arabia or by others, everybody should pull back to allow peace to take place because I think one thing is sure, no one has thought about the Syrian people during all of this. Everybody has been using Syria as a proxy for something else. And American foreign policy thinking is all proxy thinking because when uh, the opposition to this recent event took place, if you look at what was being said was, oh, we can't do this, that's a win for Putin. Oh, we can't do this, that's a win for Iran. A zero-sum game. Completely zero-sum game with nobody thinking about Syria, peace, reconstruction. We have to move to a real solution, not to this zero-sum thinking. It's, it's beyond Syria for the U.S.-Turkey relationship. You have the S-400 issue and punitive measures being taken by the U.S. Congress against Turkey. You have been in Turkey. What's your sense of the Turkish response, their sentiments to what has been happening with the relationship with the United States? I think everybody needs to find a constructive way forward. And I really believe for my own country, we have to understand the situation better. Uh, the idea of uh, bearing down on Turkey right now is again, completely a misunderstanding compared to what we should be doing, which is solving the region's problems. Uh, I'm an economist, so I look at the economic situation in Turkey, and I think about the fact that uh, the U.S. has broken every export market of this country. Ironically, it wasn't the purpose, but Iraq was a major market for Turkey, and then the Iraq War not only devastation, but also massive refugees to Turkey. S the Syrian operation, another market for Turkey, it ended up millions of refugees. Iran is a major trading partner for Turkey. The U.S. puts on devastating sanctions, by the way, that the whole world disagrees with, every country. But the U.S. says, by ourselves, we're going to put on sanctions, and everyone else has to obey that. That is economically devastating, also completely wrong in my view, because the Security Council supported unanimously the agreement with Iran, and then comes Mr. Trump and opposes it, one country out of 193 countries in the United Nations. Then the United States says, 
trade war with China. That's another market for Turkey. So I say as an economist, are you kidding? How much pressure can you put on your ally? But, but on, the other, on, the, on, the, allies. on the flip side, <laughs> Trump does seem to be following certain things that you agree with. Pulling back U.S. military from Syria is one example. As a disruptive force, would you categorize Donald Trump as anti-establishment? And if so, how so? Trump's decision to pull back from Syria, I support. But I wish he had some understanding, 360-degree uh, understanding of uh, what is happening. Because at the same time that uh, he does that, which I agree, he's trying to crush the Iranian economy. It's devastating for the civilian population. Why are we putting these sanctions on? Similarly, uh, making this uh, removal from Syria fine, but bring in the United Nations to help solve these problems. That's what the UN is about. But unfortunately, the Trump administration has not believed in the United Nations. So it's believed in US power, but not using the international rule of law. So in this particular case, I'm uh, supportive, but only if we put this in a broader context. If what has happened in the last couple of weeks is turned into peace, because that's what's urgently needed. So what needs to happen for it to be turned into peace on both sides, the US, Turkey, other players? Well, I don't think the US is the main actor in this right now. I think the first thing is that the regional powers, that's Turkey, Iran, uh, Saudi Arabia, should understand end this violence. This has been a botched, Saudi Arabia terrible with idea. Trump now sending additional troops there? I think the point should be for the regional powers to stop using the big powers from outside to play games one against another. And I'm pretty sure that Turkey understands that clearly. I think Iran understands that clearly. I hope Saudi Arabia could, or the Gulf countries in general could understand, nothing is working if there's raging war going on in Syria or in Yemen for that matter, uh, and so on. All of the talk about new conflicts, say with Iran, you can't even imagine how this world would be destabilized if there were a new outbreak of war. So in this sense, I believe that the region uh, needs to take some action to say, end the wars, start the reconstruction, let the economy start to breathe again, uh, because economics is a positive sum, you make not these a points. negative sum. You make these points in your latest book, A New Foreign Policy Beyond American Exceptionalism. Tell us a little bit about this idea of American exceptionalism and how does that then play out vis-a-vis -vis its relationship with Turkey and broadly in the Middle East? Exceptionalism is the idea that uh, you can behave according to any rules you set and you don't have to behave according to global rules. And unfortunately, America came to that idea because America is a very powerful country militarily. And so uh, Americans told themselves, this is the American century now. We run the world. And they picked up the baton where the British Empire had left off because the country that had had that feeling in the 19th century was Britain. Britain ran the world. The sun never set on the British Empire. Uh, and only a few countries in history have had that arrogance, uh, by the way. But the United States became very arrogant to the extent of saying, our foreign policy is not diplomacy. Our foreign policy is if we don't like you, we overthrow you. And the US engaged for decades in regime change operations. Uh, we had the CIA to take governments out when we didn't like them, assassinations, coups. Operation Timber Sycamore. Well, in Syria, President Obama signed a presidential finding that the CIA and Saudi Arabia should cooperate to overthrow the Assad government. That is a classic regime change operation. We're trying to overthrow the government in Venezuela right now. 
very few countries have a foreign policy like this because very few countries are powerful enough to say, we don't have diplomacy, we overthrow you. So this doesn't work. Uh, the US has been involved now in countless wars, starting with uh, Afghanistan, by the way, going back not only to 2001, but to 1979, because the US put in what became uh, the Mujahideen, that, uh, then it became Al-Qaeda, then it became the Taliban, everything. It started with the US, because the idea was to set a trap for the Soviet Union. Then in 2001, after 9-11, the US invaded Afghanistan. Then in 2003, the US unilaterally invaded Iraq. Then in 2011, the United States with Saudi Arabia tried to overthrow Assad. Then in 2011, the US led NATO to overthrow and kill Muammar Gaddafi. What is the result of all of this? Afghanistan, devastated by 40 years of war. Iraq, unstable until today. Syria, devastated by war. Libya, in basic civil war since then. That's power, that's recklessness. And that's my point, that this is not foreign policy that works. This is arrogance of using the military for things that have no military solution. People want economic development, they want to be able to live. They don't want to be dominated by foreign powers. And so the whole US idea that they get to choose other countries' governments is a failure. I would like this region to take responsibility. You're echoing Trump well, in a lot of things you're saying right now. Except for the fact that Trump is trying the same exceptionalism but on the cheap. Because the way he's doing it is through strangling sanctions. So he wants regime change in Iran by sanctions to isolate the Iranian economy, to say to Iran, you can't sell any oil to the world, and to say to 191 other countries, you can't buy from Iran. Are you kidding? How can the United States tell all the rest of the world you can't do business with Iran? Where does that arrogance come from? Confusion, maybe? Well, it of course comes from confusion. It comes from ignorance of history. When I think about the fact that- Because the, the Turks say that the Americans are sending mixed messages to them, or have been, on Syria, on the safe zone. Well, I don't even think it's mixed messages, because message implies that there's information being transmitted. I think that there really is a, a lot of confusion. Uh, and, uh, but then how do you get to what you are saying if there is so much confusion? Well, my own view is that uh, a lot of this problem that we've had actually dates back even before the US confusion. It dates back 100 years, 100 years to this year. Because 100 years ago, the Versailles Treaty was signed. The Ottoman Empire was ended. And immediately after signing the Versailles Treaty, Britain went into Iraq. Why? Oil, of course. Uh, they wanted the oil. They started grabbing. Uh, you had the first aerial bombings, uh, which was Britain bombing Iraq already back in the early 1920s. So these games started 100 years ago. The empires finally collapsed, mercifully. But who came in? The United States uh, to pick up uh, the same kind of behavior. The United States was vastly inexperienced compared to Europe. Uh, sometimes the US did good. But in 1947, the US signed the National Security Act, which established the CIA, not just as an intelligence agency, but as a secret army of the United States. That was not a good idea, because that got the US into the business of regime change. And that has been the unending weakness of American foreign policy. This idea that you don't negotiate with the other side you try to crush the other side. You try to overthrow the other side. No country in the world can do that. And if it could have been done in the past, it would have only been in the worst brutality. But if we're trying to live in a civilized way in the 20th, now the 21st century, we have to do it through diplomacy. And my view is we, the United States, I'm proud to say, invented the United Nations live up to the UN Charter. 
the first rule of the UN Charter is you can't even threaten another country under the UN Charter. You can't say, I'm going to wreck your country, I'm going to destroy yeah, your country. Yeah, but that happened in 2003. The UN was discarded. The UN was ignored. The other countries of the UN Security Council said to the United States, don't do that. Don't go into Iraq. And you know what the United States said? Ah, there goes Russia trying to weaken us. There goes China trying to weaken us. You know what the truth is? Russia and China were telling the United States the truth. Don't step on that hornet's nest. Are you kidding? If you step on that hornet's nest, you will be stung 10,000 times. So they were not weakening the United States. This wasn't a game. This was a warning. France gave the warning, too, in that case. And now 16 years later. And it's been nothing but trillions of dollars of loss, destabilization. Of course, the U.S. in its uh, confusion, as, as you rightly put it, uh, didn't want to, wants to fight Ar Iran to an irrational extent, but it opened up Iranian influence much more. <laughs> it, it, Ar Iran has just saved uh, the prime minister of Iraq from uh, being toppled. Uh, so the U.S. got it wrong again and again. The reason fundamentally is the United States does not understand this region. How could it? It's a very young country. This is a very old civilization. Uh, this place where we are, Istanbul, has been a global capital for 2,000 years. Uh, Byzantium, Constantinople, Istanbul, a great capital of the world. The United States has been around uh, roughly a tenth of that time. Uh, and so it's a baby uh, in, uh, in this. And it should not be trying to set all of but the there parameters. Is, but there is palpable fear in Ankara, in Turkey, elsewhere, that as the U.S. recedes back to mainland U.S., yes. it's leaving a trail of devastation behind. The withdrawal of the U.S. from the region is the right thing. The U.S. should not be the military force in this region. It doesn't know what it's doing. This is proved time and again. But there shouldn't be a vacuum either. First, there are three major powers in this region, Turkey, the Arab countries, especially the GCC, and uh, Iran. Okay, these are three civilizations. They're not just countries. These are three civilizations that date back more than a thousand years of interaction with each other. Everybody knows each other very, very well. We need an equilibrium. We need an understanding. Live in peace. You don't need the United States to keep peace among the three. And what, of course, happens in this region is Saudi Arabia says, ah, we have the United States here. Now we can go attack Iran. That's our enemy. So each one tries to play the United States or Russia or others against each other. No, let the big powers go out. Let the rule of law of international uh, UN charter take hold. And let the three major powers say, let's stop the wars. We have economic development to do. We have climate crisis. We have a water crisis in this region. But you were rising nationalism. You've got anti-immigrant sentiment. Yeah, you know, I don't think we're cursed. Uh, I think we're always at risk of making terrible blunders. And uh, I'm trying to propose the principle that 100 years is enough. Uh, we had the 100 years of Versailles, OK, put an end. Even let this uh, operation in Syria be the start of Syrian peace. Let the process, uh, the Astana process of Turkey, Russia, and Iran be the source of new peace among the major powers in this region. This really could be the basis of something vastly uh, beneficial for everybody. The last 20 years has been really tough. Uh, of course, 9-11, uh, and then war, 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 war. We've got to put an end to that 20 years. Let's have peace now. We have to put an end to the 100 years of imperial meddling in this region, which hasn't done anybody any good. There's another hard message for this region, which is uh, unfortunately a tough one, but requires a lot of work, which is uh, this is the oil region. That's why 
so many powers flooded in, otherwise they wouldn't have cared. They were all trying to grab resources for decades at a time. But oil actually also has to end because we have to move to wind and solar power and renewable energy in the coming years. And so even those vaunted oil and gas resources, which was everybody's dream or fantasy over the past decades, isn't worth very much right now because we have to move to a zero carbon energy system. Otherwise, we're going to kill ourselves a different way through human-made climate change. And so we have a lot of work to do. But the main message, I think, for this region is it's time for peace. It's time for technology improvement. It's time for ecological care, for facing the water crisis, the sandstorm crisis, uh, the uh, pollution crisis in the region. And you can't do that at war. You have to do that in peace. Professor Jeffrey Sachs, thank you so much. My pleasure. Thank you.